All right, buckle up everyone, because today we're diving headfirst into a legendary tech rivalry from the 80s, Amiga versus Atari ST. Ah, this brings back memories. Those were the days, right, when computers were like new frontiers. Exactly. And we're not just skimming the surface, we're going deep, deep into the hardware, the silicon heart of these machines. The brains of the operation. So, for everyone listening, get ready for a technical deep dive, because we're uncovering how these 8-bit titans actually worked. Under the hood, where the magic happened. They both came out around the same time, but man, did they take different approaches. Graphics, sound, even how they handled memory. Totally different philosophies. And those differences really shaped what each machine was good at, what kind of software they ran, what they were known for. So let's start at the beginning, the heart of it all. Both the Amiga and the Atari ST used the Motorola 68000 processor. A solid choice back then. Powerful little chip, a hybrid, really. 1632-bit. Big step up from the 8-bit world. But here's where things get interesting. The Amiga, especially in later models like the A3000, had this trick up its sleeve, an upgrade pack. Yeah, that was huge. You could actually swap out the 68000 for even more powerful Motorola chips, like uh, 68010, 68020. Even the 68030. meant you could keep your Amiga running strong longer, you know, handle newer software as it came out. The Atari ST, stuck with its original processor, couldn't quite keep up. So right away, you see a different mindset. Amiga was designed to be flexible, to grow. Forward thinking, absolutely. And that forward thinking, it really shines when you look at the custom chips. This is where the Amiga really took off, really differentiated itself. Agnes, Denise, Paula. Three chips, each with its own special job. Like a specialized team working behind the scenes, handling graphics, sound, memory, and doing it efficiently. Very efficiently. And here's the kicker. They had their own direct access to memory, up to two megabytes, dedicated to those chips. Huge at the time. Two megabytes just for them. Why so much? Because it freed up the main CPU. Let it focus on running the share, so to speak. The result, smoother multitasking, better graphics, richer sound, really blew the competition out of the water. So while the Atari ST was using its general purpose processor to try and handle everything, the Amiga was delegating, like a well-oiled machine. Exactly. And it really shows when we start talking about graphics. The battle of the pixels. The Amiga was ready for anything. Supported both NTSC and PL, so different TV standards weren't a problem. But it went further than that. The Amiga offered all sorts of different resolution modes. Gave developers and users more choice. You wanted more colors, go for lower resolution. You needed sharp detail, crank up the resolution. It was adaptable. Lots of options. But how about those colors? Was it stuck with a limited palette like most computers back then? Not a chance. The Amiga had a few tricks. One of the coolest was ham mode, hold and modify mode. Basically a way to squeeze a ton of colors on screen. 4,096 colors simultaneously. 4,096. Wow blew people's minds back then. Right. Especially folks doing graphic design, video work, a wide range of colors was huge. And then there was overscan, which let you push the boundaries of the screen even further. Higher resolutions, especially useful for video and film. So a real powerhouse for visual creatives. But what about the gamers? How did all this impact those pixelated worlds? Games always push the hardware, right? And when it came to sprites, those little moving objects, the Amiga was ahead of the game. It had eight hardware sprites, each with its own bag of tricks. So like spaceships, characters, anything moving around the screen, those are sprites. Yep, exactly. And they weren't just simple shapes. The Amiga let you overlap them for complex visuals, control which ones appeared in front, and even had this cool attach mode. Attach mode. It meant you could use two DMA channels for a single sprite, giving you more colors and depth. Plus, all this was happening with dedicated DMA channels, didn't bog down the main CPU. So smooth and surprisingly detailed for the time. All right, so points for graphics go to the Amiga. What about sound? Could it deliver a sonic punch to match those visuals? Here's where Paula comes in, that dedicated sound chip. Four independent sound channels compared to the Atari ST's three voice chip, like a mini orchestra built in. So each channel on the Amiga, you could program it with a different instrument, sound effect. Precisely. And you had control over volume, pitch. You could even combine channels for richer sound, stereo effects. So you could get pretty complex with the soundscapes. Did this impact games much? Oh yeah, huge difference. More immersive, atmospheric. Compared to the Atari ST, it was night and day. All right, so we've got the processor, those custom chips, impressive graphics, a killer sound system. Anything else hiding under the Amiga's hood that we should know about? One more secret weapon, the blitter. Often overlooked, but essential to the Amiga's performance. The blitter. 
Sounds kind of ominous. What did it do? It was a hardware block transfer engine. Basically, it was a speed demon when it came to moving blocks of memory around. Crucial for graphics, where you're dealing with lots of pixel data. Like a dedicated highway for all that visual information. Keeping things running smoothly. Exactly. And it wasn't just about moving data. It could actually manipulate it on the fly, combining images, creating special effects, even handling things like transparency and shadows. Stuff PCs couldn't do for years. Wow. Ahead of its time. Absolutely. Another example of the Amiga's philosophy, offload tasks to dedicated hardware, maximum performance. But of course, all this power needs fuel. So let's talk memory. The lifeblood of any computer. Both the Amiga and the Atari ST had their own memory setups. But the Amiga, with those custom chips, had some unique needs. Chip RAM, right? That's it. Chip RAM, the fast access memory used directly by those custom chips. And how much you had? Well, that depended on your Amiga model. So more chip RAM meant those custom chips could really work their magic. You got it. But here's the catch. Those chips could only use chip RAM. Run out of that. And it didn't matter how much total RAM you had. Those chips were starved. So it wasn't just about how much lineage memory you had, but how it was organized. And <sighs> it gets complex. And that's a big difference between the Amiga and the Atari ST. The ST was simpler, no chip RAM worries. But it also meant it couldn't quite reach the performance heights the Amiga could. A classic trade-off. Simplicity versus specialized power. And, like always, the best choice depended on what you needed the machine to do. But for now, let's take a little break, let everyone process all this tech goodness. Welcome back to our Amiga vs. Atari ST showdown. We left off talking about chip RAM. It sounded like a double-edged sword for Amiga users. It definitely had its quirks. Those early Amiga 1000s started with a mere 256 kilobytes of chip RAM. Expandable to 512, sure, but still. Not much when those custom chips are hungry for data. Not at all. Later models, like the 500 and 2000, they bumped it up to 512K base, expandable to a full megabyte. Better, but imagine running a complex game or graphics program with only that much. Like trying to fill a swimming pool with a garden hose. Ha ha, pretty much. That's why the E3000 was a big deal. One megabyte of Kip RAM standard, and you could push it to two. Now those custom chips could breathe. Unleash their full potential. Yeah. But if you hit that Kip RAM limit, you were stuck, right? Even with tons of regular RAM installed. Yep, those custom chips were picky eaters. Only chip RAM on the menu. Some folks went for special expansion boards to add more, but those could get pricey. Classic tech dilemma. Gotta upgrade just to keep up. It was a common problem. Thankfully, there was another option. Fast RAM. The custom chips couldn't use it directly, but it was faster than regular RAM, and the main CPU could access it quickly. So it helped ease the bottleneck. Exactly. Shift some operations to fast RAM, free up more of that precious chip RAM for the custom chips. All about balance, really. Highlights another difference with the Atari ST, right? Definitely. The ST, simpler memory design. No chip RAM, no fast RAM, no worries. But also, not the same performance potential as the Amiga. It's amazing how those design choices really defined each machine. Absolutely. And speaking of performance, remember that Blitter chip. It might sound boring, but it played a huge role in the Amiga's graphics prowess, especially alongside those custom chips. Refresh my memory. What was the blitter doing exactly? Efficiency. That was its game. Moving data around quickly, freeing up the CPU, keeping those graphics smooth. It had these dedicated pathways, DMA channels, each with its own control. A well-choreographed data dance with the blitter leading the way. And it wasn't just moving data, it could manipulate it too. It had a built-in logic unit, allowed for all sorts of fancy tricks. Like what? Imagine combining images, creating transparency, even generating shadows. Cutting edge stuff back then, and it did it all incredibly fast thanks to that dedicated hardware. A built-in graphics processor, practically. In a way, yeah. And it worked seamlessly with the other custom chips. Blitter handled the heavy lifting, custom chips focused on creating the visuals and audio. True teamwork. Makes sense why the Amiga was so popular for games and creative software. It was a symphony of hardware, each part playing its role. And speaking of the Blitter capabilities, let's get a bit more technical. Don't worry, I'll keep it understandable. Okay, bring on the tech talk. All right, so the Blitter had these things called min-terms. Basically, they let programmers define very specific logical operations for the Blitter to perform on the data. Logical operations. Sounds complex. Think of it like this. The blitter could look at data from multiple sources and then combine it, filter it, manipulate it based on specific rules, building blocks for creating those fancy visual effects. Okay, I think I'm following. So these min terms gave programmers a lot of control over the blitter. Precisely. Fine-grained control. 
It's one reason developers love the Amiga. They could really push the hardware, do things that seemed impossible at the time. So the Blitter wasn't just about speed, it was about flexibility, too. Exactly. And that flexibility, combined with those other custom chips, well, it made the Amiga truly revolutionary. A testament to the ingenuity of the designers, you know, the enduring legacy of the Amiga. Amazing how those design choices, even something like a chip for moving memory, had such a big impact. It shows that innovation often comes from thinking differently, right? Finding creative solutions. Thinking outside the box. So how do you see the Amiga's impact on the wider computing world? Did its unique architecture influence what came after, or was it more of an outlier? That's a good question. In many ways, the Amiga was ahead of its time. Custom chips, multitasking that focus on graphics and sound, it pushed the boundaries of what personal computers could do. It did feel futuristic back then. It was, in a way. And it found its niche, you know? Creative fields, video production, music, game development. You can see its influence in early desktop publishing, 3D animation, even the demo scene. Those Amiga demos were legendary, pushing the hardware to its absolute limits. Exactly. Showed what the machine and the community were capable of. But its impact on mainstream computing? Well, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Business decisions, the rise of more standardized platforms. It's a what-if moment in tech history. What if the Amiga had become more widespread, right? Yeah. Would we be using computers differently today? Who knows? Maybe that focus on multimedia, on creativity, would have changed how we interact with technology in a fundamental way. But history is history. The Amiga may not have conquered the world, but its legacy lives on in the hearts of its fans and in those innovative design choices. Well said. The Amiga holds a special place for many people. But let's not get too sentimental just yet. We've covered those custom ships, the Blitter, but there's still one crucial piece, the graphics architecture itself. Mm -hmm. How did it create those stunning visuals? Ah, uh, yes. Prepare for a journey into the world of bit planes, color registers, and the magic of raster graphics. And you'll see a lot of these concepts, they're still relevant today. The technology's evolved, but those core ideas, they've stuck around. Okay, time to unravel those Amiga graphic secrets. We've talked tech. But now let's see how it all appeared on screen. It was quite the show. Hardware and software working together, all those custom chips making it happen. So where do we even begin? What's the basic building block of those Amiga graphics? Bit planes. Imagine them like layers. Each one, a grid of bits. And each bit, well, that's a pixel on your screen. All right, so each bit's a pixel. But how do we go from black and white to those Amiga colors everyone loved? Color registers. The Amiga had 32 of them. Each one holds a 12-bit value that defines a specific color. Like a painter's palette, each register a different shape. Exactly. And the bit planes, they're like masks. They decide which pixels are visible. Then those color registers, they come in and assign the actual colors to the visible pixels based on how the bit planes are set up. So it's like layers, right? Yeah. Bit planes control which pixels are on or off, then the color registers paint them. You got it. And the more bit planes you use, the more colors you could have on screen at once. One bit plane. Uh -huh. Two colors black and whatever color was assigned to register zero. Simple, classic. But add more bit planes and the color count explodes. Two bit planes, four colors, three bit planes, eight colors, and so on. So with six bit planes, the Amiga's max, you had 64 colors on screen at once. Pretty good for the time. <laughs> it was impressive, but there were limits. Chip RAM, remember, could restrict how many bit planes you could actually use. Because those custom chips needed their share. Right. And some display modes, especially the high-resolution ones, they used fewer bit planes to get that sharp detail. A trade-off. Resolution versus color depth. Always a balance to strike. But don't forget, the Amiga had a secret weapon. Ham mode. Hold and modify. It could squeeze out 4,096 colors at once. 4,096 colors with only six bit planes. That sounds like magic. It was clever. Yeah. Each pixel, instead of representing a color directly, it modified the color of the pixel before it, based on the bit planes. Made for smooth gradients, subtle variations, things you couldn't do with regular bit planes. Like a continuous flow of colors, not just a fixed set. Exactly. Ham mode opened up all sorts of possibilities. For artists, game developers, sure there were limitations, had to be careful with your bit plane arrangement, and complex images were tricky. But for the time, it was revolutionary. Really shows the lengths they went to, getting the most out of the hardware. But before we move on from bit planes, how was all that information stored in memory? Was it just a jumble? Organized chaos. The bit planes were arranged in a specific way in chip RAM, each one in its own block of memory. The order they were stored in, that determined their priority, which one appeared in front of the others. Like a stack of see-through layers, 
Top one takes precedence. Perfect analogy. And the Amiga's hardware, it was designed to grab and display this bit plane data efficiently, line by line. That's how you got that seamless image on screen. Amazing how that all happened in real time. Those custom chips never took a break. A testament to good engineering, that's for sure. And there's one more piece of the puzzle we haven't mentioned. The copper. Ah, yes, the copper. We've touched on it before, but what was its role in all this? The copper, it was a programmable DMA engine. It had direct access to the Amiga's custom chip registers. That sounds pretty technical. Think of it like a director making real-time adjustments to the graphics hardware. Not just moving data, but actually controlling it. Precisely. It had its own instructions, a copper list, that ran perfectly in sync with the electron beam painting the image on screen. Synced with the display hardware itself. That's impressive. It was. Allowed the copper to do all sorts of things. Changing color registers, tweaking display settings, even triggering other hardware events, and all with pinpoint accuracy. Like a mini programmer built into the graphics system, making tiny adjustments as the image is being drawn. Essentially, yeah. The copper gave developers a lot of control, let them create effects like scrolling, split screens, even simple animations, all without bothering the main CPU. The Amiga philosophy again, right? Offload tasks to dedicated hardware, efficiency and flexibility. Exactly. And it's amazing, even today, how relevant these concepts are. Modern GPUs, fancy graphics APIs, they all rely on those same ideas. Dedicated hardware, precise timing. Those 80s innovations still echoing through tech today. The Amiga might not have ruled the world, but its legacy is undeniable. Lives on in countless devices and technologies. Well, as we wrap up this deep dive into the Amiga versus Atari ST, I think it's clear both machines left their mark. They inspired creativity, pushed limits, and wowed a whole generation. The Amiga, with its custom chips, it definitely had an edge in graphics and sound, but the Atari ST, it held its own, made its own contributions. Both deserve a spot in computing history. A testament to those engineers and to the communities who embrace these machines. Absolutely. And for everyone listening, I urge you to explore the world of retro computing. Experience these machines firsthand. Appreciate the impact they had. Until next time, keep those pixels glowing.